Disruptors and Curious Minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. Every week we get to explore what the future looks like from the techno technologists, the builders, the coders, the developers, the, the idea people that are looking to move us in the direction that all the science fiction writers tell us we are headed. Um, today we have a really fun episode that uh, that we're ready to talk about. Um, the idea of enabling um, enabling this uh, this technology, this Web three, this blockchain based technology, to the masses through tools and tool sets that allow just not you know experienced coders to get this stuff done, but you know also people like Mark and I to maybe put stuff together on our own. Also, how to advocate for this technology and how to show people in real time at conferences, at live events, the benefits of, of this technology. And that it's not just about, you know, Silk Road and, and Bitcoin and all that fun stuff that, uh, you know, it gets it gets wrapped into sometimes. So but Mark. Silk Road fun, was it? I guess it depends what your idea of fun is, doesn't it? Whether Silk Road was fun or not. Didn't Donald Trump just say he's going to free that guy? Um, oh my blockchain, gosh. blockchain. <laughs> Look, I bought show and tell. I bought some, I bought some merchandise. To, because I wanted to show you how I first met our guest Tyler Adams today because I've been to a lot of blockchain conferences and as we alluded to before the show in the green room they're pretty meh a lot of the time you go around you collect bags you you talk to people who aren't running the companies or don't know what they're talking about and then you get drunk and that's about it so I was very happy at Paris Blockchain Week to see a stand with t-shirts on it. And so Tyler Adams, he is the CEO of COS. We're gonna get into that. He was representing the Neo blockchain as well at Blockchain Week. And essentially he had these t-shirts with his NFC chips on. If you're just listening to this, I've got a t-shirt, it's white, it's got an NFC chip built into it. And you could color in your own t-shirt. My daughter did this one, then upload the details to the blockchain. So authenticity, you know, no, transparency all of the good stuff and then you know you and they just not just t-shirts you could be in bags clothes rings anything you could put a chip in bikes cars guitars i don't know i guess it's the the, the possibility is endless um so yeah that's how i met today's guest tyler with some t-shirts awesome well let's let's get let's get right into the chat first of all thank you to our sponsor wripple.com marketing's on-demand talent platform uh these guys have enabled uh our show over the last close to a year and they've been they've been fantastic so what what they're really good at doing is bringing groups of vetted solopreneur specialists together and organizing them in groups and helping them execute interdisciplinary projects for you you know sometimes we need to flex out and we need to uh lean on additional resources maybe we don't have the budget we don't have the headcount don't have the expertise so uh ripple does that wripple.com they do it very well uh, i would encourage you to check them out and if you ever want to work with mark and i we're, we're on the platform as well so without further ado mark you and your amazing thinking on paper hat let's introduce our guest yeah today's guest tyler adams co-founder and ceo of cos um a web web3 software development community um he's an expert programmer coder advocate we've just learned of blockchain technology so he, he's been in dc recently so hopefully we'll get into that but product design engineering world real world applications of this stuff you know what is it all? good stuff decent stuff bring him on let's go off we go off we go tyler welcome he's joining us from fort collins colorado ironically in the same town where two friends of mine from high school actually used to brew beer for a, a brewery out there so uh small world becomes smaller tyler thanks for joining us in the early bird session from fort collins how are you today i'm pretty good um it's gonna be hot, <laughs> what, what's hot then? um it's probably gonna be around 40 c today here so okay. it'll be pretty warm i'm not seeing any clouds but I mean, I will probably be hiding inside. I think that's you, you, you do know that a lot of my family and friends listening to this are in England and they will not be in any way jealous of your hot day when it's just a barrage <laughs> of rain over there. But uh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, well, 
let's uh, so tyler what we tend to do with our with our episodes we we you know we're we write mark and i are writers we do a, a bunch of other things but what we like to do is explore this interesting through line between our guests so we like to try and tie these episodes together a little bit mark do you want to do you want to pose the question left by our last guest for tyler and we'll kick that off yeah we would like to start every show with a question from the last guest for the next guest last week's guest was T uh, Todd Hasselhorse of Healy, he was into logistics and blockchain. And his question for you, Tyler, is how do we, we create applications that impact the real world in a meaningful and positive way? And how do we create an ethos where that's the point? And that's his question for you. The entire question. podcast. That's an entire Yeah, exactly. Podcast. Keep it short. <laughs> Should we we'll stretch now and get right into it? All right. Yeah. Um, this is something that I, I spend a lot of time thinking of, um, you know, ever uh, my undergraduate degrees in mechanical engineering. And that's a very big question, um, in that industry or in that, in that discipline because of the kind of the, the general like feeder into, um, general contracting and like the military industrial complex. Right. So, <laughs> um, I spent <laughs> quite a bit of time thinking about that, that topic. Um, I also recently attended a, a really good panel by a friend of mine or where a friend of mine was, um, seated or invited to participate on at consensus about public goods. Um, and COZ itself actually is one of the, the first proto legal DAOs in Colorado. So, um, and as a team that built a lot of open source software, that's kind of close to my heart as well. Um, I think there are two things on this. One is the, the way that, um, incentives work, <laughs> um, in general, and we see that especially, you know, if we're specifically talking about the blockchain chain industry, um, there are kind of two different competing, I guess they're not really competing forces. There's a, there's a goal and a, a focus on obviously making money, right. Which is kind of the VC side, um, which if I'm being honest, in a lot of cases is counter to the, this desire for public goods. Um, there's also this interesting and kind of unique situation um, that was really discussed in that panel that I found interesting. And it was about the, the, the idea where in, within the blockchain industry, we're really seeing the, the proliferation of open source and open source for the sake of like open source and openness and collaboration being a, um, a revenue driving and effective um, kind of flywheel to um, develop tech, um, technical innovation, right? Um, so a lot of these grant initiatives um, and kind of ecosystem and community funding projects have gone on to be revenue positive, and they've actually given back in because they were the benefactors of this these community projects. They've gone back and they've actually given um, funding in for kind of the next um, wave of projects in that ecosystem. So I think, um, that, that initial kernel of positivity and support usually from within a community to improve yourselves, um, is really where this started. I think taking that and then combining it with open source in general is something that we're starting to see, or that we've seen in the blockchain industry. That's relatively new. Um, I don't know if I really. It kind of answered your question. I think that um, the culture of supporting your community um, without really the expectation um, of anything like directly benefiting yourself is probably the the thing. But that's kind of hard to to come across anywhere outside of a. Um, kind of an open, permissionless, democratic ecosystem, right? Where everybody feels like they have a stake. Everybody can see where the fund, like this funding is going. Um, there's this transparency layer. I think, honestly, that's kind of a critical requirement. You know what's, you know what's super interesting about that? It, it, as you were talking, it made me think uh, back to this book I read a while back. It has nothing to do with blockchain, but it's called a pattern language. And it's basically like this architectural city building 
uh, book that, you know, there are 263 different patterns, right, that, that are required to build. And they talked about how technology actually pulls us away from each other a little bit as humans, right? So when, when we were walking, we were in villages together, we were walking together close in proximity, maybe a foot apart, but then cars came about that pushed us into metal boxes that were 20 feet apart, you know, or whatever, right? But now this is an, another layer of technology that actually aims to bring us together back to this form that is kind of governed by two forces that Mark and I talk about a whole lot, hierarchical forces and emergent forces, right? And this, this shift from hierarchical leading to emergent leading. So you mentioned DAOs, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations. You guys are organized. COZ is organized as a DAO. How do you manage? Because there needs to be a little structure, right? But then there also needs to be the power for things to emerge as superpowers of the community come up. So how do you balance those two forces? Painfully. Um, I think for us, the thing that we run into the most is engagement. Um, and participation within DAOs, right? Which is something that isn't new. Um, I mean, we we see that both in blockchain and out, right? These organizations or communities that um, where informed or like educated participants um, need to participate in decision making is a that this is a big top issue, right? Um, generally like as and obviously structure like my role in coz doesn't kind of impl imply that we run this way um since i'm the ceo which kind of implies it implies there's this very hierarchical structure um generally the way that this works and it i don't think this works well for every group or every community um but it kind of falls on me to advocate for the team constantly um, to make sure that everybody um, is informed and can actively vote. I think, you know, for probably seven, it's been almost eight years now, um, we generally just use basic polling. If people don't participate, if there's not a quorum for the votes on certain topics about um, projects or like an activation or something like that, then like I'm happy to step in on that. But typically I try to push that down into the team as much as possible. Uh, uh, what's this, the COZ DAO participation? How many members do you have? I'm in a few DAOs myself. And to be honest with you, when I vote, I don't spend very long. I'm in too many and I don't spend very long or maybe I don't care enough or I don't really look into it and I just I could just click a button and go go generally and I think a lot of people do this go with the general consensus and I, I, I ha, what's 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 the solution Tyler I mean what would what, if you could so, change it what would you do tomorrow um yeah so there's a scale we're definitely talking a, a scale difference so for us we are a we're based on the Colorado co-op model. So Colorado is very famous for having these co-ops. One of the big ones, if you're familiar with New Belgium Brewery, um, they were a co-op and they all voted to sell recently um, to uh, like a major kind of umbrella organization, right? Um, for us, we're kind of similar. So we're a, a DAO in the sense that we're structured to align um, with kind of the principles of a, like a modern, like web three DAO. Um, but we're, it's in our articles of incorporation, right? Um, I don't like the level or the size that you're probably talking about is like thousands of people, possibly hundreds for us. It's like two dozen people, right? And these people all have, um, shares in the actual organization. So they have a vested interest. Um, and the organization's success, although they have different type, we have multiple types of, of equity that's distributed. Some are DAO based and some are, or like voting rights and some don't have voting rights. Um, so I don't. It sounds like a much healthier it, it's, um, DAO. Well, it, it is and it isn't. <laughs> um, it's still beholden to the same, a lot of the same principles and shortcomings of what we're running into right now within like DAOs in the 
um, in the blockchain space, like directly, right? Um, engagement, again, becomes one of the primary issues, right? We, but we also see that in pretty much anywhere where voting is required or proposing of decision-making topics. Um, so that, and I mean, we're also, we sit in like, it's called the grant shares DAO as well within the neo ecosystem, which has funding. It's supposed to be for public goods to build out the ecosystem. Um, we also run into the same issue there. It's engagement and our team, like we don't engage as much as we should, because I don't know that, you know, the incentive mechanisms are there. The motivation is there and the time required to invest in it. Um, is not there isn't a perceived value out of it right it kind of becomes this this issue or they're maybe not even aware um you know you're if as a, at an individual you're motivated to maximize your your time right you want to optimize it if you can get a return for doing the minimum amount of work in a lot of cases that's the direction people take um unless they're really passionate about it so for us at least what we've been what we try to do, and this is something that is more of a recent initiative, is to start re-engaging people that, you know, have been involved in the community. We, you know, we've been around for about eight years in this industry. So going back, re-engaging with people and trying to get them reconnected um, to the projects and the technology we work on. We're a very different organization than we had been. Um, so it's usually like selling these people to re-engage them, to re-enable them and get them to participate in decision-making. Um, that's the, that's the tricky part about it is, is the, how do you, how do you carry the energy, right? Because humans are really good coming together when there's like a, a catalyst and there's like, oh man, that sounds great. And it's like, whoom, everyone comes in and they're like, Hey, this is great. This is great. And like a month later you see just like trickle out. Right. So how do you keep those little packets of energy in that equation of like, Hey, if I do this, I'll get that because what happens is I think when the real magic happens, people do things without expectation and just to see something grow, because like you said, there's the passion, right? But you can't expect passion to fuel something for longer than a certain amount of time. Right. So it's a tricky balance, right? Right. And then how do you, how do you make people passionate about something else? Right. Because that's the thing, like as a, as an organization, you have to continually evolve. You have to change based on the market, especially in the blockchain industry. Like there's a new thing that's coming out. I mean, you guys, that's what this podcast is kind of about to some extent. What is going on? What are the new trends? What is interesting? Um, and in this space, we have to pivot. And how do you maintain that, that passion through multiple, like, technology cycles through multiple products, um, through multiple clients, potentially, it becomes really complicated. Um, that is okay. honestly one of the hardest parts about my my job. <laughs> well, so if we can we pan out and, and like look at your jobs. When I first met you, and I, I showed you this amazing t-shirt earlier, which has got Neo written on it, and you've spoken about COZ, so if I called it cause, that's my that's my Englishness just reading out that. Um how could you speak to us just so we know where you're coming from? From like what is COZ, what is no, how are they connected, and what are these pivots that you saw? What where are they coming from in terms of your current business? Yeah, so um so COZ started as a um really just a group of hackers, linguists, um, engineers that um, were interested in delegated Byzantine fault tolerance um, as a consensus protocol, um, primarily because of a, a blockchain called AntShares, right? Um, and you following that, Jeremy? Did you get oh, yeah. that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So this community of like open source hackers and stuff that just love reading about the this ecosystem or this industry kind of organically formed this group called um coz um, and you can call coz or cause it's actually an acronym um from our bef before we were legally allowed to incorporate um since that's 
kind of how long we've been around now. <laughs> um, the um, the group kind of came together and we defined a number of projects. They're primarily um, self-identified by the members. Sometimes they would the group members would collaborate on initiatives together. Other times they'd work on individual projects. Um, and then every week we would distribute tokens to those community members that participated. So we would vote based on progress and direction. If somebody was doing translation, for example, um, for documentation or new documentation or building a wallet or a smart contract compiler, we would vote at a leadership level and we would distribute tokens to, um, to those people, um, those contributors. And that was um, kind of how our organization started. Um, then we've also kind of pivoted to doing like hackathons, to doing brand work, to doing activations like the shirt over the years, um, we do marketing services and advisory as well. Um, the, the tie to Neo is that that's kind of the, you know, that's the ecosystem that we've, um, we've worked within, um, predominantly, although we're kind of ecosystem agnostic, um, we just, we have kind of a close relationship tie to the Neo ecosystem. Um, so yeah, we've kind of done because of this, the way that the organization came up, we've kind of done a bit of everything <laughs> at this point. And we, we've started to get very good at tying a lot of these different disciplines together um, to provide like value, like the shirts, for example, which have oh, yes. core technology. There are smart con, there are actually multiple um, distinct smart contract focus areas that are deployed to build out the shirt, right? There's um, design work, there's marketing work, there's um, activation and booth design work, UX work, there's hardware product design, there's copy. Like, I mean, this kind of is a fully vertically integrated blockchain product that kind of demonstrates the what we do. Is that thing that you're holding your hand this? That is, this is a ring. Version. This is the ring. Yes. Okay. So, so, okay. So we're going to get to the ring. So essentially that ring is a, a the same concept as this, but it's the same. Yeah. So it's a similar a technology. Um, so here's, this is what Mark is holding up. So this is a, a button and it has um, a kind of state-of-the-art biometric chip in it that's similar to what is used in um, the new EU passports. Um, and then we have... My apologies. I, I undersold that chip then. I'm sorry. That was... We have a... It, it, well, it is an NFC. It's passively powered, which is kind of critical for the, the product space that this technology is going into. Um, but then it, it has an application layer that's blockchain native that runs on it. Um, and then it's token bound. So without, without internet access, anything that has that chip in it with the software package can assert its authenticity. Um, if you have internet access and you can access the token, you can also get all of the provenance information of the physical asset. Um, you can understand some of the, if somebody customized it, for example, or a vendor to find more information, you can get access to that. Um, most notably, you can actually build dApps against it. Um, so you can pretty, what we're basically building out is infrastructure with this specific technology um, that allows application developers to um, build dApps that use any physical asset that we deploy. I like what, the what idea that, that if the infrastructure, like? sorry to jump on you, Mark, just, just yeah. real quick. I, I, I like the idea of infrastructure, right? Because I, I always think about this as audience or community infrastructure, maintaining these like personal bridges to individuals that, that let things flow both ways. Like I could send something to you, you could send something to me, whether it's information, whether it's an idea, whether it's a financial, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So this, um, it's also, it's kind of important for, for, us and this kind of goes back to the community development piece like building this as an infrastructure technology helps create a community around it of developers right um 
when I say DAP, when I say DAP development, what I um, what I kind of mean, and I'll use an example of consensus last year. Um, so it, consensus last year, and actually at Token Twenty Forty Nine Singapore last year as well, um, we did an activation where people received the the old version of this, the ring, um, and they could they were token bound, they had their ring, they could go around to 13 different other projects, I believe, or maybe 10 other projects in the in the community that were supporting this initiative. And when they scanned their ring, um, that data would go on chain, there'd be a contract invocation. Um, and if the ring was authentic, there was a generative NFT contract that was also deployed that would update um, for the the owner of the ring, right? So um, this is kind of like a toy, you know, it's a gamification thing at a conference. It's kind of cool. It's very lightweight. There was no blockchain knowledge required, um, but you can also do something similar with um, like fractional real estate as well, right? So another like very just off the top of my head example would be um, if you have a, a dongle or some physical asset and you have a like a timeshare um, kind of product that's built on chain, right? Where there's bidding for access to the timeshare, um, you could have a physical access key, right? Which can directly and natively integrate with the DAP that handles access rights to uh, the timeshare, right? So then... You could have like a ring, for example, or a, even a key card or something like that. You scan it. It does a contract invocation. It looks up and asserts the authenticity. It checks whether that physical asset or the owner of that physical asset has spot access to that location and it unlocks the door. Um, that's We've kind of done an activation like that also. That's what these are. Um, so these are mechanical chests that are um, tied to the blockchain um, as well. Um, so, you, so you mentioned, you mentioned a lot of brand work and I think like a lot of brands listen, you know, listen to this show to kind of see what's, what's happening and where, where things are headed and where they should be pointing. The question that always comes up is like a lot of this stuff, you know, a lot of the use cases and that are coming out are, are cool. It's technologically based use cases trying to find, uh, an application. So a lot of times though you have, I think brands are, are thinking, well, do you even need that technology to do certain things, right? So how many ideas have you run across within your ecosystem or brands bringing ideas to you and, and you know, you end up getting to the point where it's like, well, you could really just kind of do that with a database, but here's what Our blockchain. Yeah. Here's why. So how do you, how do you run, how do you navigate uh, people through that kind of this or that um, equation? That's a really Good question. <laughs> Usually, um, typically, if we work with a, a client that's not Web3 native, um, the first thing we do is an exploration, right? We do an exploratory exercise to understand what the requirements are. Um, actually, even at a higher level, we want to understand what their needs are, right? What are their user needs? What are they trying to build out? What issue or problem are they trying to solve? Um, usually blockchain is not the answer and it or they've been mismarketed towards to use blockchain in a certain way in the past and it becomes a bit of a sensitive topic because blockchain is a tool and sometimes like it's not the right tool right um we've we haven't really, we've experienced it a little bit with the physical asset stuff, um, but it's primarily been on the, like just the general tokenization um, use cases. We, we see that a lot. A lot of the time it, it, it typically starts with a very gentle explanation of why it doesn't necessarily make sense um, as an organization, because we, we're like a software services or solutions provider, or product solutions provider. Um, we don't necessarily brand ourselves. We're primarily blockchain focused, but we do take other work as well. Um, it kind of internally becomes a contract uh, discussion about whether we want to 
work on a not blockchain project if that's what they come to us with or kind of an education about like what actually what is actually a proper use of the the tool like if they if they and i'll use like a an example that i've completely like bleached out so <laughs> we're not using like brands or anything like that but a lot of the time we'll come we'll be um engaged to work on a blockchain project they don't necessarily know how to use the technology but they want to explore the the value proposition of of blockchain right um that works relatively well for us for our creative team and our product team um it's just it's a lot of work right because then you start to wonder like is this like are they really trying to understand is a research thing or is this something that they're they want to invest in they just don't know how to do it or where the the technology can exist um we've had that show up it hasn't shown up honestly very much within the physical asset space because i think um it, it, again it, primarily on like the software, pure software solution side. I think with the physical asset space, it's so new that people aren't thinking about it as like, we want to get into this like long-term. So a lot of the stuff is like at a pilot level, we want to evaluate it, we want to understand it. Um, we've tried to, actually we've spent a lot of time doing what I would call like product market fit with the technology. I think we, at least at the security level um, and product level, um, we have a, a pretty solid lead on kind of the, the space. So we've been taking advantage of that to do like PMF testing every month, basically. So um, mark those shirts that you have, for example, um, that product configuration didn't exist until ETH Denver, which is like six weeks before Paris Blockchain Week. Okay. Um, and at ETH Denver, we actually, we did a different pilot that didn't even use the shirts. We just had a couple shirts there to test out before pushing it into something larger. At ETH Denver, we actually did um, a test with the Denver Walls project. Um, so. Um, just to give a brief on that, there's a worldwide walls mural festival. It's all over. Um, it's these amazing muralists um, that fly in from all over the world. Once a year, they come to Denver. It's one of the cities. And then they paint these, like, in some cases, 50 foot tall murals. Um, we collaborate with that team to provide the same technology that's in Mark's shirt on bronze plaques that are attached to the wall. Um, so for ETH Denver, we did a an activation where people could go around and they could collect effectively the, the artist signatures off of these waypoints, and then they could redeem them at a local brewery. Um, so that was kind of our product market fit test. For Anything that involves a brewery is going to work. But but like okay you may and I think you had a wallet at some point there's a ring there's a t-shirt there's a plaque on the wall and if you if I if I'm thinking as you're talking I mean dynamic NFT soulbound tokens you could car deeds house deeds the last will and testament I mean there are infinite number of use cases where this could be be used and make what exists better, more efficient, quicker, more trustworthy? There are, yeah, in the hardware space, there, there are a number of core use cases that, that we are, we're really focusing on. One, and the most, this is the most important one, I want to be very clear on that, is to allow me to go to Vegas to play live action Dungeons and Dragons or role playing games with my friends because I don't play card games. And I well, need that, that corresponds to the question in the chat that the C is the first market friendly products you think will pick up a larger user base. That's that's it. <laughs> yeah. So flying. I mean, I want to go to Vegas and unlock doors and battle dragons and then get the chest. But 
in the chest, I want like a Louis Vuitton bag or something, right? <laughs> like I want real swag. Like, I guess it's not really swag at that point. I want real merchandise <laughs> that I can take out into the world and use, right? Um, so there's the gamification piece that we, we play with a lot. Um, the provenance piece is also very critical, um, especially for these luxury brands, which are starting to get kind of eaten alive in that because of this, this authenticity and this provenance. Um, there's also this interesting, um, and that also applies to just art in general, right? Um, so embedding the technology in canvas, for example, in watercolor paper. Um, so artists can prove the authenticity in a certain like creator um, level or owners can assert ownership, that kind of thing. There's a lot of value there. Um, the, the interesting thing that I'm really motivated to, to push on with this, and this is where there's a, to me, a pretty big um, value add for a lot of kind of retail products is that it, it de commoditizes a lot of stuff that we think of as a commodity product. And what I mean by that is that you're both, so you're both wearing hats, right? Um, those hats, as soon as they're manufactured, as soon as they walk out of the store, they start to lose value because they're used hats, right? Yeah. Um, the resale on those hats, you know, there is a market for used hats, but you're not going to get the same price as what you purchased the hat for, unless it's in a lux like a luxury goods class, right? Where there could be some appreciation, right? Um, because it's, there's a collectability to it. Um, by adding a, a blockchain component to it, where, um, you can have value that can get assigned to the physical asset itself. You can change that curve so that the, the phys these com things that are kind of commoditized can actually appreciate in value, um, not necessarily because of the materials, which like most products don't appreciate because the materials, unless there's some scarcity there, um, but because of the, the other, like the intrinsic utility of the, the product itself. So for example, um, let's say you have a, a North Face jacket, right? Um, if you take your North Face jacket and you, it's a, has this technology in it and you climb all, uh, Colorado is known for having these 14ers. They're like 52 or 54, I think. And they're mountain peaks that are above 54,000 or 14,000 square feet or 14,000 feet elevation, sorry. Um, if you climb those and you can cryptographically prove you're wearing your jacket at that time, when you climb the mountain, you can tap scan it in. Um, maybe there's a loyalty rewards program because the person, at, like all the other people that are climbing the 14 are gonna see somebody in that jacket up at the top of the, the mountain, right? Um, so I think yeah, just real quick, I think another interesting piece to this too, is what you're saying is the value of something that's a commodity. If you can uh, assign and capture value of the use of that thing by a certain individual or doing a certain thing that could actually decommoditize the use of it. So like if, if, if Tom Brady bought this hat first and I was a wicked Tom Brady fan, you know, I could see that, you know, maybe he wore the hat at certain points. Right. But as a, as a, as, as a fan, I would want to demonstrate that. So as long as that value uh, of use of the product was demonstrable, I think it gets exciting for people. So someone could in, in your use case of the jacket, you could demonstrate somehow that you've climbed a few 14ers, right. In a, in a way. And right. then North Face could then also they they North Face would know that, and so they can. I, I, you you don't want to incentivize people who aren't capable of climbing giant mountains to go and climb giant mountains because there'll be a reward if they do. But there is some way of like we could we could put it in the thinking on paper merchandise and give people exclusive episodes of podcasts, for example. I mean, it depends on what your brand is looking to do, but there's bi-directional. 
Yeah, maybe in the case of like North Face, for example, they issue a discount in their online store or yeah. when they're you're physically present or something like that, or they offer access to exclusive events for, and it's not necessarily tied to the user, it's tied to the actual product itself. So the product, their products inherently kind of get out of that that trend where they devalue over time, right? You can actually have these physical assets that increase in value. Yeah. Is it is it safe to say that this this particular technology that we're talking about allows the um, the activation and almost automation of audience relationships? Is that kind of a way to look at it? Um, kind. I think it it introduces a, a kind of a decentralized evangelist tool, um, right? Where the thinking on paper shirt is a good example of that, right? Where if you did have some reward mechanism that was tied through a DAP to wearing or engaging with that shirt, then people are going to be incentivized to wear your shirt more. They're also going to be incentivized to engage people about the shirt because they're going to want people to interact with it, right? It's like, yeah, evangelism, true fans, it's creating community, it's creating relationships or deepening those relationships. I'm trying to I'm trying to think about how like from a brand perspective how to really simplify it right because right now what what CMOs are probably hearing so if we were to jump back in a time machine um, before Mailchimp was Mailchimp and I'm just using them as a basic example and Mailchimp's message to the community was like hey guys I really want to tell you about TCP/IP it's really amazing SMTP is awesome you know let's talk you through all of these the technologies that allow email to work. And people are just like, what the hell is this, right? But then you start saying, hey, I could help you simplify and manage and grow your audience using this tool by you being able to talk to them more frequently over technology, right? So what is what is that message that we need to get to these CMOs or or even heads of companies that are that are kind of like, oh, this is a MailChimp, you know, kind of moment, right? MailChimp's not an official sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> Yet, yet, Mailchimp, hit us up. Um, yeah, I think the people talk like apparel is a major, especially within like I guess apparel companies, right? A lot of apparel companies that is their their thing is the name. I don't know on a Mailchimp side that would be kind of hard, um, but we could probably figure something out. <laughs> um, the it, i think on the like the collectible and the evangelism side it just promotes and rewards people for doing something they've already been doing and because it aligns the incentives there it motivates people to advocate right like i have i like vans i grew up in southern california so i have like vans shoes for example I'm going to be much more motivated to talk to people about vans if I get some reward for doing that. Right now, it's very difficult to incentivize somebody in a decentralized way when they're out, you know, walking around to do that. Um, by giving, by using kind of one of the key value propositions of blockchain in that it's always present and available it's globally accessible um and it, the sustaining load over like a centralized resource or back end um alongside like kind of the secondary market issues with with that <laughs> as well um it it introduces a tool that people that these these brand um owners can can leverage in a pretty simple way um I feel like I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of words out there since I'm, I'm thinking. No, 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 no. This is, this is good. As, as you're, as you're thinking through this and you know, we're, there was a great comment that, that jumped in and I always thought this was really interesting. Um, so th this particular comment addresses like the idea of prosumerism, like the producer consumer kind of balance and relationship. And I always thought in light of this, like do ban do brands really want to open up access to uh to let people affect what the brand is itself and i think wouldn't wouldn't the ultimate application of blockchain technology of a dao to be open source 
create a brand from a community level or give your community, give your audience. So we're talking old technology. Brands have an audience, right? Give their audience permission to affect the future of the brand and reward them for doing it the right way. Yeah, we've actually there. Um, I can't think of a lot of these projects, like any names of projects off the top of my head. I mean, Nouns Dow kind of comes to mind immediately. Um, there are some others that are probably even more um, or further on along the curve on this as well. Um, but we have started to see some of this, these projects or initiatives show up, right? Where there isn't, there isn't necessarily any like fixed like direction or marching order. They're completely open. The The communities vote and engage on the direction they deem is best. Um, and that's the direction that it goes in. Um, the, but we've also already been kind of doing that in the apparel space forever because like, Mark, you have a thinking on paper hat on, right? Like if I wore a thinking on paper hat, and I went to go speak to somebody about thinking on paper, my, the way that I communicate your brand is going to be different than the way that you would officially or like formally communicate it. So we already kind yeah. of do that. It's just, it's rewarding people for doing advocacy that currently isn't being rewarded and it incentivizes it. Right. Especially. If, and when we talk about apparel, like that's how a lot of this stuff, um, becomes popular and built a reputation, right? A lot of it is word of mouth. Um, so, so yeah, I, that's an interesting, it's an interesting use case for the technology. Um, it's one of the ones we're investigating. We certainly, um, have been piloting some of that, like for consensus this year we did, we also did shirts like at Paris blockchain week. Um, but we did COZ ones instead. So we did some COZ ones, we did Smart Economy podcast ones, we did a Waxman shirt, um, we did an item systems shirt, and then we did a pilot app, right, where people could go and they could engage with one of each of these brands. And if they did, they could um, rent, win an iPad, yeah. for example. I, so. so that's a big thing. They're automating. So the brands have been al already doing like user journey, user experience design audience journey right we're just we're just turning that into a way to track that and enable you know this bi-directional flow that that mark and i talk about a lot and you talk about like so to go back to the question in the chat about how do we what do we need to do to convince brands to allow that kind of right sharing i don't think we should try to convince the brands that the mainstream global hyper brands, we're not going to convince them. We shouldn't be trying to convince them. We should just let them do their thing. Their system isn't broken. Like some brave souls will face difficulties and they will experiment and they will realize perhaps that these are solutions to their challenges, but most of them aren't going to embrace it and we shouldn't waste our energy doing that. You say this a lot, Joe, but it's gonna take one incredibly bold, brave brand or a web three native brand that's going to break through into the mainstream that's going to lead by example and 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 okay let everyone else get on with, with doing what they're doing and focus on what what we've got and the people who are doing it I, I, we can't change the world and i don't think one of the problems i always find with most web three people trying to evangelize web three is they're trying to change something that a doesn't need changing and isn't going to be changed so you're just focusing your energy in the wrong place I get angry about that. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's it's the it's the hierarchical versus emergent flow, right? Because yeah. you know these brands are top down and like, hey, here's what we're doing. Here are the assets. Here's the campaign. Here's all of that. Yeah. But a brand isn't anything without its audience to interact with it, right? You know, if it's if there's no interaction, nothing happens. Um, be mindful of time, Tyler. Let's let's focus on your handoff for our next guest. So who's our next guest, Mark? And, and well, when Tyler mentioned, because you said you were in Washington the other day, you, you're mm. you're involved in the political side of blockchain. And as much as I just want to jump into that when I would, I'm not sure we have time, but our guest next week is um, Messina Tilleman Perez of Circle. She's the VP of Impact at Circle and she's in DC. And I think she is 
possibly someone you might have met when you've been there. But so she's our guest next week. Um, we, the show's all about humanitarian aid pipelines, blockchain for good, financial education, financial mm. aid in these dispersed communities around the world that aren't as perhaps fortunate as us. Um, yeah, what's your question for her? Um, so I guess my my question is probably around um, kind of the lowering the bar and improving accessibility to these tools. So um, it would be like, what what can like Web three um, like community members do to like make these like solutions and these opportunities more accessible? Um, you know, I think we've worked with another, a number of projects trying to identify how we can do this stuff. Um, ultimately, you know, they, they kind of get stuck in the blockchain space. Um, like there are a lot of initiatives that, um, provide humanitarian aid within web three. And then there are a lot of initiatives that do that outside of web three. Um, but they generally feel kind of isolated to me at least. Um, so I'm kind of curious what we can do to bridge the gap between the two. Okay. Great question. Great question. And I've been blurred into the quantum ether, so I'm in superposition right now. Uh, but, uh, Tyler, it's been great, uh, great chatting with you today. Really enjoyed this discussion. I think if brands are looking or brands are looking for someone to help them figure out and navigate this stuff or also looking to figure out how to demonstrate this stuff in real life. Yeah. Uh, sounds like you're doing some, some great work in there. Mark, while I retain <laughs> my uh, unquantum position, uh, tell them about the book club and we'll get everybody out of here. Yeah, you're mentioning the quantum position because in book club, we're currently reading The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli, which is all about quantum physics and gravitational fields and... It's part of our quantum season, which is coming up. The summer sort of, of quantum, Mark. The summer, summer of, quantum. of quantum. We've also read Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, which is brilliant. If you want to work on how you make your decisions, the Nexus, your book club. We read books and we get we read between the lines and we get the insight that we wouldn't get if we read on our own. So we bounce ideas around and look for meaning, make sense of things that don't make sense. And P.S. If you don't want to read the books, just listen to us talk about them and uh and and we'll go there uh tyler thanks so much for joining us today uh we're, we look forward to hearing more about what you guys are doing mark will put a great show right up for everybody where they could find you and um yeah man stay in yeah. touch so last quick shout out to ripple w r i p p l e marketing's on demand talent platform over 3000 vetted solopreneurs here at your disposal disposal to point towards any project that you're struggling with or want to outsource so check those guys out they've been great uh, thinking on paper.xyz. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Bye bye.